Today we're going to be discussing camera dynamics and how you can use them to control the appearance of your shots using depth of field and z-axis perspective. There are specific elements that control camera dynamics and we'll cover how to manipulate each of these in this video. At first, camera dynamics may sound like one of those obscure technical subjects that you're forced to learn in school, but never actually use in the real world. But that couldn't be further from the truth. For photographers and videographers alike, mastering depth of field and z-axis perspective are skills that distinguish professionals from amateurs. By definition, Depth of field is the distance between the nearest and furthest points in a video or photo where objects appear to be in focus. Z-axis perspective refers to how the background objects in your image appear relative to the subject and foreground in your image. By controlling these elements, a knowledgeable photographer or videographer can achieve the look and feel they want in their imagery. Things that are in focus attract the viewer's attention while objects that are out of focus tend to be ignored by viewers. Photographers and videographers can use depth of field to their advantage in order to draw the viewer's attention to what is important in a scene and obscure things that might be a distraction or simply undesirable. They can also use depth of field to enhance artistic appeal or help set the mood in a scene. There are three factors that influence depth of field. They are iris or aperture setting, focal length, and subject to camera distance. Each of these elements interacts differently with the lens and changes how the final images appear. Iris and aperture settings refer to the same part of a camera. Which of these two terms is used typically depends on whether you're talking about a still camera or a video camera. The term iris is typically used in videography, while the term aperture is commonly used in still photography. No matter which term you use, the iris or aperture is the part of the camera lens which controls the amount of light exposure by adjusting the size of the hole through which the light passes. For the sake of efficiency, and because this tutorial is geared towards videography, we'll use the term iris in this video from now on. The f-stops on your lens, or in the menu setting in some cameras, are the settings that control the iris. The range of f-stops available varies and depends on the lens you're using, but common settings range from 1.5 to 22. On the f-stop scale, the smaller the number, the wider the iris opening and the higher the number, the smaller the iris opening. It seems kind of backwards, but if you know that these numbers are actually the bottom half of a fraction, the denominator, that represents the area of the lens that's open, then it starts to make more sense. So what does this have to do with depth of field? Well, opening up the iris, that is making the hole bigger, will have the effect of making your depth of field shallower. Conversely, closing down the iris, making the hole smaller, will have the opposite effect and make your depth of field deeper. Let's look at some practical examples. In this shot, the f-stop is set to 1.5. The gardening gloves are the objects in focus. But if you look closely, only the center of the gloves are actually in focus. The front and back of the gloves are a bit fuzzy. As the camera tilts up, the flowers in the background are completely out of focus. This shot has an extremely shallow depth of field. In this next shot, the f-stop is set to f4. More of the gloves are in focus, and as the camera tilts up, you can see the first flower pot is coming into focus. In this shot, the f-stop is set to f8. The gloves are entirely in focus, the first flower pot and garden spade are in focus. The objects in the background are still out of focus, but definitely getting clearer. Jumping to the last shot, the f-stop is set to f22. The difference is obvious. This is a much deeper depth of field, and you can see the gloves in all the flower pots with relative clarity. These rather dramatic changes in depth of field are achieved by changing the iris setting of the camera. However, changing the iris setting is not something you do arbitrarily because it directly changes the image exposure. Getting the proper image exposure is absolutely critical when capturing both video and still images, 
There are three elements you can adjust that will allow you to compensate for changes you make in the iris and still achieve the proper exposure. These are lighting, ISO setting, and shutter speed. Each has its advantages and disadvantages and can affect the look of the final image. So it's important to consider these effects when you're deciding which technique to use. Changing the lighting is the most obvious and effective method to use if you want to set your iris to a specific f-stop. If you want to capture a deep depth of field in your image, you'll want to increase the amount of light on your subject so you can close down the iris. If you want to capture a shallow depth of field, you'll want to reduce the amount of light on your subject or reduce the amount of light getting to the sensor so you can open up the iris. When you're shooting outdoors, you can often use natural light and can make lighting adjustments by moving your subject to brighter or shadier areas. If that's not practical, let's say you want your subject to be in front of a specific background. You can use flags or nets to shade your subject. This could allow you to open your iris enough to reduce your depth of field. Conversely, you could use reflectors or bounce cards to add light to your subject, and that could allow you to close your iris in order to deepen your depth of field. Field. It's not uncommon for beginners to believe they can get away with shooting using only natural light. However, sight conditions aren't always favorable and you need to know how to adapt to every circumstance you might encounter. Becoming a truly professional videographer requires a fundamental mastery of lighting. This knowledge is essential in videography for all sorts of reasons, and being able to control the depth of field in your shots is one of them. Fresnel lights are mostly what you see on movie sets, and it's for a good reason. Fresnel lights let you control and focus the lighting, and they're available in a wide range of intensities that can go as high as 20,000 watts, so they tend to be the brightest lights available. Portable open face and incandescent lights are commonly used for smaller commercial shoots and can provide the optimal amount of illumination you would need to light a scene or interview shot in an average size room. LED lights are a relative newcomer to the lighting industry, and while they have their definite advantages, such as lower operating temperatures and energy efficiency, they generally provide lower levels of illumination, although this may change as the technology improves. When you're using set lighting, there are different techniques you can use to adjust the lighting levels to get the effect you want. Let's say you want a shallow depth of field in your shot, and you need to open up your iris to do that, but the lights are too bright. Here are some techniques to help you reduce the intensity of your lights. First, you can simply swap out the light you're using to a less powerful, lower wattage light. If that change isn't enough, you can use scrims on your light. Typically, these are available in different strengths that can block more or less light and can often be stacked. Sometimes, as well as reducing the intensity of light, you may want to soften it. Using diffusion gel in a diffusion frame or clipping it directly to your light will do this. But know that diffusion also blocks a certain amount of light. Another option for reducing the intensity of a light is to attach neutral density or ND gels to your light or diffusion frame. ND gels are specifically made so they don't change the color temperature of your lights and they are engineered to reduce the light intensity by a calibrated amount. ND filter gels can be layered to increase the amount of light blocking power and they're available in a variety of filter strengths typically labeled in multiples of 0.3. In theory, you should be able to turn down your iris one full f-stop for every increment of 0.3 filter strength. If you have the space on your set, you can choose to move your light further away from your subject because the further you move the light away from your subject, the less intense the light will be. If you move it closer, it will intensify the light. There are features on most of the different styles of lights that can come in handy when you're adjusting them. Fresnel lights are unique in that they have a type of lens that focuses and concentrates the light better than any other type of light. These can be used with one or more scrims to reduce the intensity of light when needed. The light intensity can also be adjusted using the knob on the back. Flooding out the light will lessen the intensity and cover a wider area. Focusing the light will increase the intensity, but will also spot the light down to a smaller area. Open face lights can also be spotted down 
but they use a parabolic reflector to concentrate the light. The knob on the back can be raised and lowered to move the lamp or bulb forward and backwards in the reflector. This changes the angle and intensity of the light and can be helpful when you need to punch out the maximum amount of light to get a deeper depth of field. LED lights often have built-in dimmers to control light intensity. They can go from very dim to moderately bright. However, they may not provide enough light to enable you to get a really deep depth of field. This type of LED light cannot be focused. Using the barn doors can shape the light, but it does not change the intensity. Using professional lighting techniques takes more skill and work, but doing so will generally yield the best image quality. It's an important and worthwhile skill set that should become a regular part of your workflow. Clearly, there's a lot to know when it comes to lighting, and we've only scratched the surface here. So you might be wondering if there's an easier way to compensate for changes in iris settings. And the good news is that yes, there is, but it only works if you have enough light to begin with. ND filters are a quick and easy way to reduce the amount of light going into the sensor. They work kind of like sunglasses for your camera, but they're specially made so they don't change the color temperature of your shot. ND filters come in two forms, the ND filters that can be attached to your camera lens and onboard ND filters that are built into your camera. Higher end cameras often come with built in ND filters but usually have a limited number of stops. An ND filter like this one is variable and has a wider range of light blocking capability. If you were to find yourself in an extremely bright lighting situation, you could actually use one of these in conjunction with an onboard ND filter. Either way, adding an ND filter to your camera will allow you to open up the iris in order to get a more shallow depth of field. However, if you want to close down your iris to get a deeper depth of field, an ND filter won't help you. It can only reduce the amount of light going into your camera. It can't increase it. Now, let's look at how ISO settings affect image exposure. The idea of ISO actually hails back to when cameras used real film and there were different speeds of film. The chemicals in higher ISO film would react more quickly to light exposure so they could capture an image with greater speed and clarity. In digital cameras, adjusting ISO settings makes the sensor artificially more or less sensitive to light, so it's possible to change the iris settings and still get a properly exposed image. Different cameras perform differently when it comes to their ISO settings, and some are better than others when using higher ISO settings. Significantly turning up the ISO on a camera in order to compensate for stopping down the iris can come at the cost of sacrificing image quality because doing so can introduce noise or graininess into your image. While there are some ways to deal with a limited amount of noise in post-production, they don't necessarily work well in all situations. It's always recommended to capture the best quality image possible in the camera while shooting. There's an endless array of video cameras on the market, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses when it comes to ISO performance. If you know the performance limits of your camera, ISO compensation is an option that may work for you in some situations. But understand you may be taking a risk with the image quality, so this technique shouldn't be your first choice. Shutter speed is the setting which determines the amount of time the shutter on the camera remains open during each frame exposure. Slower shutter speeds allow more light onto the sensor so you can close down the iris to get a deeper depth of field. Conversely, a faster shutter speed allows less light onto the sensor so you can open up the iris and achieve a more shallow depth of field. Adjusting shutter speed to compensate for changes in the iris setting is a common technique used in still photography. And experienced still photographers might be tempted to try adjusting their shutter speed to change their depth of field when shooting video. But what works well for still photography can have unintended consequences in videography. In order to capture the most natural looking movement, it's recommended that the shutter be open for half the duration of each frame. An obvious exception is when you're trying to capture very fast movements, such as those that you'd see in sports. But for most videos, it's generally not a good idea to stray from these guidelines unless you're trying to create a particular effect. 
In cinema cameras, you will generally see shutter speeds expressed in degrees relative to the frame speed. So 90 degrees means the shutter is open for only 25% of each frame. This is a fast shutter speed that lets less light into the camera. 180 degrees means the shutter is open for 50% of the frame duration and is the ideal for most videography. 360 degrees means the shutter is open for the entire duration of each frame and lets in the maximum amount of light. DSLR and ENG cameras generally express shutter speed in fractions of a second. So for example, to have the shutter open 50% of the length of each frame at 30 frames per second, your shutter speed should be set to 1 60th of a second. At 60 frames per second, your shutter speed should be set to 1 1 20th or 1 1 25th of a second. Faster shutter speeds will let in less light so you can open up your iris to create a shallower depth of field, but it can also make the on-camera movement look somewhat choppy. Slower shutter speeds will let in more light and allow you to close down your iris to get a deeper depth of field, but this can come at the cost of introducing more motion blur into your image. While this technique is a perfectly valid approach in still photography, changing your shutter speeds as a means to compensate for iris settings when shooting video is probably not the best solution for those reasons. The next factor which affects depth of field is focal length. On zoom lenses, the focal length is adjustable, and that's why it's called a zoom lens. You can zoom the focal length in and out to adjust your shot framing. Prime lenses don't have a zoom feature. They have a fixed focal length. So to adjust the focal length, you actually have to change the lens. Let's take a look at some examples of what happens to a shot when you change the focal length. In this first shot, the focal length is 85 millimeters. The gloves are in focus and the shot is zoomed in very tightly. As the camera tilts up, you'll see that the depth of field is very shallow and none of the flowers are in focus. In this next shot, everything is set up the same as before, except the focal length has been changed to 50 millimeters. The depth of field has gotten a little deeper and the first flower pot is now in focus. You will notice that the shot framing has widened and now we can see more of the flowers. As before, everything is the same except the focal length. In this shot, the focal length is set to 35 millimeters. The depth of field is even deeper, but it's shallow enough so that a rack focus is still noticeable and potentially usable if that was the intention. But it's a considerably wider shot, so there's no opportunity to create movement in the shot by tilting the camera upward. This last shot's focal length is 24 millimeters, and again, all the other settings remain the same. The depth of field is even deeper. A rack focus is still noticeable, but not very useful. If you stop the rack focus halfway, you can get everything mostly in focus, but the shot framing is just too wide. The subject is overwhelmed by the background. There are also some undesirable things in the shot now, and that's not good. So yes, focal length will change the depth of field, but at the cost of altering your image framing, which often won't give you the framing you want or could even use. Given the potential for problems, this probably isn't a go-to technique if you just want to change your depth of field. So while you probably won't be using focal length to adjust your depth of field, it's important to be mindful when you do zoom in or out of a shot that doing so will affect your depth of field. The longer the focal length, that is, the more zoomed in you are, the tighter the shot and the shallower the depth of field. A short focal length is going to give you a deeper depth of field, as well as a wider shot. Now I know what you're thinking. You're wondering why, after changing the focal length, you can't just move the camera closer or further away from your subject to reframe the shot. To answer that question, we first need to look at what happens when you adjust the camera to subject distance. In the following shots, the focal length, iris setting, and ISO will all remain the same. Only the camera to subject distance will change. In this first shot, the distance from the gloves to the camera is 20 inches. You can see that the gloves in the first flower pot are in focus. The second flower pot is where the objects start to go out of focus. In this next shot, the camera has been backed away, so the distance from the gloves to the camera is 32 inches. Everything up to the watering can is in focus, so the depth of field has increased somewhat. The shot framing has also changed. In this third shot, the camera has been moved further back, so the distance from the gloves to the camera has increased to 48 inches. The gloves and all the flowers are in focus, so we have a much deeper depth of field. The shot framing is also much wider, actually too wide, so in this case it's not really working as a means to get a deeper depth of field. 
Now that you understand what moving your camera does to the depth of field, we can answer that previous question about compensating for focal length changes. Let's walk through an example. In this first shot, the focal length is set to 50 millimeters, the iris is set to f11, the shutter speed is set to 180, and the distance from the gloves to the camera is 48 inches. The second flower pot is in focus, but the watering can is starting to go out of focus, and the flowers behind it are definitely out of focus. So far, you've learned that when you change your focal length while maintaining your camera to subject distance, your depth of field changes, but so does your shot framing. That's what has been done in this shot. The focal length has been changed to 35 millimeters. The iris and shutter speed are the same, and the distance from the gloves to the camera hasn't changed either. It's still 48 inches. If you look closely, you'll see that the depth of field is actually deeper because the last flower pot is almost in focus too but the shot framing is way too wide now. So now you have the deeper depth of field, but to compensate for the shot framing being too wide, you want to move the camera closer to the subject. So now the camera has been moved forward to reframe the shot to match the framing of the first shot to a distance of 32 inches. The focal length is still 35 millimeters and the iris and shutter speed remain the same. Unfortunately, the depth of field has become shallower. When you compare both images side by side, the pictures look almost the same in that regard. So what happened? Well, in previous examples of camera to subject distance, you learned that the depth of field gets shallower as you move your camera closer to your subject. So in this example, even though the depth of field was increased by changing the focal length from 50 millimeters to 35 millimeters, moving the camera closer to the subject decreased the depth of field back and reversed those gains. In fact, it looks to have a slightly shallower depth of field now. But basically, both changes have effectively canceled each other out. So the answer to the question is no. You can't compensate for changes in focal length by moving the camera and still maintain the change in depth of field. If your shot framing is critical, using focal length or camera to subject distance to change the depth of field isn't going to work for you. It's important to understand what happens to your depth of field when you make these types of adjustments to your camera. This exercise also exposes something interesting that happens when you manipulate and combine changes in focal length and depth of field. If you're observant, you may have noticed that these two images are not exactly the same. It's a little hard to see in this side-by-side -side comparison, so let's overlay them and alternate back and forth between them to take a look. Watch the flowers in the very back. They appear to be moving forward and backwards. Now watch the flowers in the very front. They appear to be moving toward and away from the camera too. Now watch the image as a whole. It's moving kind of like an accordion opening and closing. Even the perceived depth of the folds in the background curtain are changing. Their position hasn't physically changed. It's a function of the camera's Z-axis perspective. The Z-axis is the direction that moves toward or away from the camera. When objects look like they're closer together than they really are in the z-axis, it's called compression. When they look further apart than they actually are in the z-axis, it's called exaggeration. To create compression, you want the camera far away from the subject and you want to use a long focal length. To create exaggeration, you need to move the camera closer to the subject and use a shorter focal length. Of course, you need appropriate foreground and or background objects in the shot for this effect to be of any value. The differences in the previous flower images aren't very pronounced because the change in distance isn't very big. It's only a difference of a few inches. But the bigger the changes in camera to subject distance, the more pronounced the effect will be. A skilled videographer can use exaggeration in their images to make things or people look like they're spaced further apart and distant to create a sense of emptiness or loneliness. Conversely, they can use compression to make them look like they're closer or crowded together, creating a sense of community, hustle and bustle, or even clutter. This type of effect can significantly alter or enhance the mood and artistic appeal of any scene. The takeaways here are that, at least in videography, if you really want to control depth of field, adjusting the iris on your camera is the most effective and reliable tool. To be able to achieve consistently good results in professional images, you need to understand how to control the lighting in your scene, or you need to use neutral density filters on your camera. It's important to understand how changing focal length and camera to subject distance affects depth of field, but don't rely on them primarily to make changes in depth of field because using this method won't necessarily give you the shot framing you need. 
but also know that manipulating focal length and camera to subject distance are features best applied to affect the framing and compression in your shots. And when used with skill and intention, these can be very powerful artistic tools that can raise your production values to a much higher level.